You are welcome to Tip Tooth Academy where we are devoted to building excellence in students, especially when it comes to the STEM subjects. Our video today is going to be of great help for you if you are preparing for your physics exam, particularly talking about WAHEC, GCE, NECO, GED, GCSE, IGCSE, and Co. And we are going to be using the NECO 2021 Physics Theory Paper as a guide in this particular question set. We are going to be looking at all of the questions that are featured in that exam in a bit to help prepare you for excellence so that you can be the best that God had created you to be. Now, there are so many other videos that are available from our channel, so you can just check them out, look at resources on mathematics, physics, chemistry, so that they can be of help for you to be the best and gain that excellence that you are longing for. If you are here and you are watching this video, we'll appreciate that you just take a moment to go ahead and subscribe to the channel. Just click on the subscription icon and also click on the notification bell so that you get notified of our video resources once we upload them. It's free of charge and that is our little contribution to actually make the world a better place. So our work is set out for us. Let's just go ahead and delve into our video together. Here in our very first question, we're asked to mention a device used for detecting fault in the circuits and then we have to mention one feature of the named device in A above. So I would love to actually mention a multimeter or what some other people call an avometer okay that's quite good or you can actually use a simple continuity tester the difference is that the continuity tester will only check if there is no breakage in let's say a, a conducting wire so you put one end of the wire here and you put the other hand there sometimes those um devices they just give beep sound mm, to show that there is actually no breakage on the connecting circuit and a multimeter or an avometer can also do that, but in addition to that, it can also measure so many other things. Maybe you can get to measure your current, your voltage, your resistance value, and code. that's why you are seeing that there are many divisions here. So you can set, you can just switch to whichever one is suitable for what you want to measure, and that is as good as it gets. Now, some of the features, of course, it will need a connecting wire that is shown in red and black here. And here you are going to have a display. This is actually an analog display, but some do come a digital display in which it digitizes the result of whatever it is you are measuring. And then another thing you need for them is a powering cell for you to power the device as appropriate. So that is the answer to this question, and we are good and fine with it. This question is requesting us to distinguish between simple and compound microscopes. Okay, this is just a pictorial view of what this can look like. And in a simple microscope, we have only one converging lens as opposed to two converging lens in the compound microscope. The simple microscope has low magnification, whereas the compound has a very high magnification. So you can see a bigger and an enlarged image of what we are looking at. And then in the simple microscope, the final image is erect, whereas in the compound microscope, the final image is invented. So you can just pick a combination of two of these and you get your full mass. Note that you are not requested to draw a diagram, but for us, we know. A picture is worth a thousand words. So showing you, we actually ingrain this more on you so that you will be able to recollect better if you are in your exam hall. All right. Here we are told that the mass of copper deposited on the cathode of a copper voltmeter is 450 grams when the current passes through it for 25 minutes. Our mandate is to calculate the current pass through the voltmeter, and we are giving the electrochemical equivalent of copper to be 3.33 exponents minus 4 grams per coulomb. So here, yeah, we are going to be making use of Faraday's law of electrolysis, which is estimating that the mass deposited in such a setup is proportional to the quantity of electricity that is passed through it. And for us, in this particular case, since we are having current, we can say that means that inherently the mass is proportional to the current passing through it and the product of time. So if you bring in the constant of proportionality, that's where we have our electrochemical equivalent Z multiplied by height is such that in this particular case, what we are asked to find is the current passing through the voltmeter. Okay, the current passing through the voltmeter will now be the mass divided by electrochemical equivalent multiplied by T. All right. So, if we just want to do that with all the values that we have been given, we have the mass deposited as 450 grams. We have the electrochemical equivalent, and then the time was given in minutes. We need to convert that to seconds. So we can say. The current in this particular case will be the mass, 450 grams, divided by the electrochemical equivalent, which is 
times 10 to the power minus 4 grams per coulomb. Okay, multiply by the time. The time is 25 minutes, so that is 25 minutes, but we need to convert to seconds so we can say multiply by 60 seconds. So we just need to bring in our calculator to solve for this that 450 divided by the product of 3.3 exponent minus 4 multiplied by 25 multiplied by 60. Okay, just ensure that you put in everything correctly and then we can look at that. This is 10,000 over 11 but in standard form 909.09 .09, so this is 909.09 .09. the dash on it means that it's repetitive i can just say this is nothing but 909.1 ampere that is the current that is passing through the voltmeter okay in this question of friction we are told that a wooden block was placed on an inclined plane as shown below so this is a wooden block that is placed on this inclined plane okay now if it is just about to slide we are to show that the ratio of the sine of angle file this angle file to the cosine of angle file okay is the same as the coefficient of friction all right now um, if we want to just prove that we know that normally the coefficient of friction is the force over the reaction that is being experienced on that particular wooden block and in this particular case if you are to look at it, if this angle here is file, and we are just to construct our angle something sort of this, we can see that this angle also is file because it's corresponding to this. So this angle here and this, they are corresponding angles. And that being the case, this particular F and R, we can resolve them along this file. In short, let me just move this so that we we'll see this clearly. So in moving that, this is exactly what is looking like. And if you want to resolve it, we know that we can get to just resolve this on the horizontal and the vertical component. And in that particular case, we'll see that the force upward to the plane will be giving us mg sine alpha, okay? Because alpha is the angle of inclination of that f to the horizontal. So it you have to be sine alpha. You can just recollect your Sokatua. If you just recollect Sokatua, you can easily work that out. Okay. And then in the same vein, R that we are looking at will be mg cos alpha. Now, where is mg? Mg is actually the weight of the block acting downward. So if that is the case, our coefficient of friction we can say is nothing but F, which is mg sine alpha, over R, which is mg cos alpha alpha okay so we can see that already mg will cut out such that the coefficient of friction is nothing but the ratio of the sine of alpha to the cosine of alpha of course that is tan alpha but this is what we are asked to actually prove and that has been shown as appropriate in this question on projectiles we have first asked what is the range of a projectile and then I've been told that an athlete threw a javelin with a velocity of 12 meters per second. If the javelin hits the ground after 1.5 seconds, we have to calculate its angle of projection. Now we have to take the situation due to gravity G as 10 meters per second square. In the first case, the range is the horizontal distance from the point of projection of a projectile to the point where the projectile hits the projection plane. So for this particular diagram, that range will be defined yeah, so this is actually that range that we are being asked to define. And then in the second vein, we are to look at this particular case scenario in which the athlete is string a javelin with an initial velocity of 12 meters per second, and then the javelin will hit the ground 1.5 seconds later. We are to find the angle of projection. Now, if for us to look holistically at this question, let's consider the upward movement of this particular projectile. Okay, for that upward movement, we know that. Um, generally, time for it to reach maximum height, since we are only talking about the upward domain, we can get by making use of V is equal to U plus 80. Now, since we are talking about the upward domain, we know that at the maximum height, the V is actually zero. Okay, the U, which will be the vertical component of its initial velocity, will now be U sine theta. Okay, theta is the angle of inclination, right? Then the acceleration due to gravity, because it's going upwards, that's going to act in the negative direction. So it will be minus g, not just a, it's minus g, then multiply by that t. So from here, I can say the time for it to reach maximum height 
is nothing but u sine theta over g. But then, since it's actually a two-way journey, it will go up, but it will also come down, okay? That means the total time of flight, t, will be 2u sine theta over g. I know this is a formula that is quite popular with students. I just took my time to explain it out because it's going to help us now to try and solve our question as we are giving here, okay? So, here, yeah, we have already been given the time. Now, we are looking at 2u sine theta over g, and what we are looking for is actually theta. So, we can make sine theta the structure of the formula. So, that means we can say sine theta is nothing but the total time of flight multiplied by g over 2 multiplied by u, okay? So, if you want to put in our parameters, that means we are saying that it is the total time of flight was given as 1.5, g was given as 10, 2 multiplied by the initial velocity will be 2 times 12, okay? That means that sine theta is equal to, this will be 15 over 24, 15 over 24, and then theta itself will be arc sine 15 over 24. So this is what we need to put into our calculator to get our solution out. We want to say arc sine um, 15 divided by 24. Okay, so we can close our bracket. What's that going to give us? That is 38.682. So we can say theta itself is nothing but 38.682. Or we can just say 38.68 degrees as our solution. So, so if you know the formula for the total time that it takes for the projector, you can actually rearrange to get your sine theta and then find the hack sign to pick your final answer. But I just love working from the ground also. That's why I just took my time to explain this. But eventually our final answer will be 38.68. Alright. In this question, we are being asked to mention two bodies possessing kinetic energy and then we are told that a waterfall is 108 meters high. We have to calculate the difference in temperature of the water above and below the waterfall we have to take acceleration due to gravity as 10 meters per second square. Now, for the very first question, you need to know that for you to actually answer this question, you just need to consider any object that is moving at all. So, talk about a moving car, a fruit falling from the tree, a stone that is stone, a bullet that is fired. Any one of these is going to possess kinetic energy. The velocity is what is accounting for that. And if you are able to mention two, we are good and fine. In the second case, that will be we are looking at um, the waterfall, which is 108 meters high, and that is being shown in this diagram here. Now we have to calculate the difference in temperature of the water above and below the waterfall. Now, this is what they are trying to ask us that here yeah, we can have conservation of energy from the potential energy to heat energy. Once we are able to actually get this. The question will be easy for us and we know that the formula for potential energy in this case for this um, waterfall is the mass and acceleration due to gravity times the height which the water is actually going through and then the heat energy is given as mass multiplied by the specific capacity of water multiplied by the change in temperature that change in temperature is different between the theta one at the top of the waterfall and theta two at the base of the waterfall okay so we can just call that change in theta. We can see from this formula that the mass is going to cut out and then we have GH is equal to C multiplied by the change in theta. So we have GH is C multiplied by the change in theta. So that the difference that we are asking us, the change in theta, we can obtain by saying we are using GH divided by C. And what are the parameters that we are giving? We are giving G as 10 meters per second square. We are giving h as 108 meters. We are not giving c, so you can just leave it as c, okay? I think c is about 4,200 joules per kilogram per kelvin. But since we are not giving, just leave it at that. And you can finally state that the change in temperature for this particular waterfall is 10 times 108 is 1080 over c. But then you do have to mention the unit. So it is degree kelvin, or you can say degree centigrade. is a change, so anyone will do and they'll be fine and good, okay? In this question, we're being asked what vaporization is and we're to state one effect of the increase in heat for a temperature range of 50 degrees Celsius to 100 degrees Celsius on first on plastic 
and then on iron okay very good if you want to define vaporization you can state that it is the process in which a substance changes from its liquid state to gaseous state at constant temperature student i cannot emphasize this enough that it has to be at constant temperature okay that's what we hand you your form you don't just say is the process in which substance changes from liquid to gaseous that constant temperature just has to come in place that is what we hand you your form and then Looking at the second question, what we are being asked inherently is to consider what will happen to this particular material. Is it going to melt or is it going to just have some changes in its properties as a reason of the increase in temperature from 50 degrees Celsius to 100 degrees Celsius? Of course, for plastic, the plastic is going to melt because that is way above its melting point. So, for the plastic, it's going to melt and then there will be change in its density. However, for iron, because that temperature is not going to be up to its melting point it's only going to expand and because it is also functioning as a reason of um, electrical resistance it's also going to affect some changes in its electrical resistance it also has some changes in its density so with this we've been able to look at this question perfectly this is a question on waves and our mandate is to explain how stationary waves are produced and then to look at this question and calculate the wavelength of this waveform that is shown in the diagram okay very good and very fine if you want to have a look at that for the way in which stationary waves are produced it's just by the superposition of two progressive waves that are having first the same frequency and then the same amplitude but they are moving in the opposite direction so like in this particular case you are saying that this wave this is moving in this direction and this is moving in this direction both of them they are going to they, yeah they are having the same amplitude they're having the same frequency and then they will produce a stationary wave and if you want to look at the waveform now this is the amplitude and maybe this is the time of the frequency you can see that as one is actually going on the thick the other is going on the broken line and the cumulative effect of the two at any instant in time will be that they will cancel out each other so a stationary wave will be produced so that is the answer to the first question in the second question you have to look at the waveform and we have to get the wavelength normally wavelength is the time it takes to complete one cycle so here if we are looking at this when are we going to have a complete cycle we are going to see that from this particular origin this is half of a cycle and this is actually a full cycle okay again we have another half here and here we have another full cycle and then here we have another half so what we are looking at here is that we are having four meters to be synonymous to this is one complete circle another complete circle and a half is synonymous to 2.5 cycles okay so our question is asking us um what is going to be the value of the wavelength that will correspond to one cycle so this is what we have and we can just say we want to cross multiply that in this case we have 2.5 x is equal to 4 times 1 and if we divide both sides by 2.5 this is also by 2.5 we can see that here the 2.5 here will cut then 4 divided by 2.5 what's that going to give us 4 divided by 2.5 that's what 8 over 5 which is 1.6 so x which is the wavelength is nothing but 1.6 meters for this particular waveform so we just know that it is going to take a wavelength to complete a circle but here we're having two and a half circle so which is four meters four meters corresponding to two and a half circle we can find the length that will correspond to a single circle and we just got that to be 1.6 meters okay, let's let's ask ourselves this question why is it that sound does not travel through vacuum okay so that's our first question here and then we're also being asked that when is the critical angle said to be subtended by an incident ray of light also to state one of the conditions for total internal reflection of an incident to occur okay all right for the solution to these questions in the first case sound does not travel through vacuum because sound needs a material medium for its propagation so since vacuum is not a medium it cannot travel through a vacuum okay so that takes care of the very first question now when is critical angle set to be surrounded by an incident ray of light it is when the ray is reflected along the boundary of a media so here the ray is coming initially and then is refracted along that boundary of the media then in that case we are saying that the triangle 
is subtended by that incident ray of light, okay? And then one of the conditions for total linear refraction to occur, there are just actually two of them, this and this. In the first case, the ray must be traveling from a denser medium to a less dense medium. So, the original source of the ray will be more dense, meaning that it's going to restrict the movement of that ray of light as compared to the other medium that light is traveling to. And then the second condition is that the angle of incidence in the denser medium will be greater than the critical angle of the medium. So once that angle of incidence is greater than the critical angle, then total internal reflection will definitely occur. All right. Here we are looking at a question in electricity. We are being asked what is lost foot and to state two advantages of secondary cell over primary cell. So this is just as good as it gets. In the first case, looking at loss volts, it is a voltage drop due to the internal resistance of a cell. So here, you can see we have this particular cell, okay, that is actually supposed to be producing the voltage V in this particular circuit. But that cell itself is having an internal resistance R. So what we are going to have is, of course, and the same current will flow in a series circuit. So the V that we are having is going to be nothing but the current multiplied by this small internal resistance of the cell itself then plus the current multiplied by the load the resistive load that is applied on the circuit so what we are looking at when we are talking about loss volt is the product of the current multiplied by this internal resistance of the cell so this is what is regarded to as the loss volt okay and then in the second question the secondary cells actually the advantage it has over the primary cell is that first it produces current for a longer time. You can use it for quite a longer time as compared to the primary cell. Then, of course, it can be recharged. So, you use it, it's depleted, you charge it, then you can use it again, charge it, use it again. But for the primary cells, once you use them, that is all. You just need to discard them or even need to discard them properly. Okay? So, that is that with respect to this question. We are still continuing with our questions on electricity, and here we are to state the condition under which resonance occurs in an AC circuit. And then, furthermore, we are being told that a series circuit of 5 ohm resistor, 2.3 milli Henry inductor, and 0.03 microfarad capacitor is connected in series to an AC source. Our manage is to find the resonance frequency given that pi is 3.14. Okay, so that is good and fine. Here, this is going to be the solution to our question in the first case the resonance will occur when the inductive reactance is equal to the capacity of reactance in an ac circuit so so this second question is actually a very typical um, case scenario of when we have resonance because they are asking us to find the resonance frequency so what is happening is that at resonance frequency sc is actually equals to xl and what's the formula for x what's the formula for sl that means we are saying that xc is one over 2 pi fc okay is equal to xl is 2 pi fl so this if you actually cross multiply and rearrange we are going to get that the frequency which is the resonant frequency is nothing but 1 over 2 pi multiplied by square root of lc student you can actually lay your hands on this and try to get the formula out but starting from where we are coming from the resonance frequency is actually given as this and for this question that's exactly what we're going to be using to say that here what is our l our l is 2.3 milli henry that is 2.3 milli means times 10 is power minus 3 henry okay and what's our capacitance okay that is 0 0.03 microfarad that is 0 0.03 micro means times 10 is power minus 6 farad so so if you want to use these parameters you can say our f is nothing but 1 over 2 pi, pi we have been given as 3.14, then multiply by the square root of L, that is 2.3 times 10 raised to the power minus 3, multiply by C, 0 0.03 times 10 raised to the power minus 6. So, you just need to capture this correctly so that you don't make any mistakes, students. With this, we cannot find our resonant frequency by bringing our calculator to say we want to look at 1 divided by I want to put everything in bracket 2 times 3.14 multiplied by the square root of the square root of now I want to put this 
everything together in bracket so that don't miss out that square root so that 2.3 exponent minus 3 okay times 0 0.03 exponent minus 6 so i can close that bracket come out of that and check to see that i'm actually on the right track and then i can press the quarter sign so this is 19169.72 1916972 okay you can just see i want to approximate this and if i bring this decimal one two three four okay four places i can say this is 1.92 i'm rounding up this six to one and add it to this one then times 10 raised to the power four i've moved the decimal place in four places and then the unit for frequency is hard so that is going to be the resonant frequency for this particular circuit as given in this question. In this question, we are to mention two types of unit cells of a cubic crystal other than the face centered cubic, and then we are to calculate the half life of a relative element of decay constant 0 0.0385 per second. Okay, good and fine. The other unit cells, apart from the face center cubic, is simple cubic crystal as typified in sodium chloride crystal and then the body centered cubic crystal so if you just mention these two you are good and fine with question number a okay and then in question number b we are being given that the decay constant lambda is given as 0 0.0385 per second our mandate is to find the half-life now half-life in this particular case is given as 0.693 divided by lambda and since that lambda the decay constant was given as 0.0385 we can just put in the value to say this is 0.693 over 0.0385 per second so we just want to put that value there we can make use of our calculator 0.693 divided by 0.0385 this is 18 okay so this is 18 and now as i see we are reversing this so it will be 18 seconds as a half-life of this radioactive element yeah in this question we are being mandated to draw a label diagram of a photo cell and also mention two applications of a photo cell so no problem if you want to draw a photo cell i'll just do a simple diagram here you can have this and Typically, we are going to have an anode, okay, that is going to be collecting rays of light, and then a cathode that's going to be receiving electrons from there. So I can link this to a microammeter, and then I can have, let's say, battery source, and just finish up like this, okay. So normally, the operation of the photocell will be that rays of light will be coming in incident on the anode okay so this here is the anode this is the anode and then here this is a cathode and then with those rays of light coming in what we are going to be having is that electrons will be ionized and they will move to the cathode from the anode and then that will complete the circle so that we can have electricity flowing in this particular case so this is just a typical example of what we have and here um critical things to note is that here we are going to have vacuum this is actually vacuum and of course this an evacuated glass tube so that's why inside it we are going to have vacuum so this is just a very simple diagram of a photocell when you are drawing you can just Represent the anode as a single line, represent the cathode as a single line. Maybe you just draw your evacuated glass to just do something like this and you are good and fine. Okay. So you don't need to you don't need to be too artistic if you are drawing. I just want to give a good representation for you. If you can do this fine and good and no problem, you also be awarded your full mark. That is not a problem. So let me just straighten this up a little okay and then i can just include this as a glass tube okay which is evacuated that's why we have vacuum in that particular so 
if you can label all of this and just get it like that you are good and you are fine and then to look at the applications this photo cell actually finds applications in buckler alarm automatic door tv camera detection of light measurement of light intensity so that is that with respect to this particular question here we have to explain fundamental quantity and to measure two quantities which have the same unit as energy as a reason of definition fundamental quantity is any physical quantity that is not dependent on other quantities it's a standalone quantity is any of the quantities from which other quantities are derived so that's why we call it fundamental okay now in the second question we are being told that we are to look at two other quantities that have the same unit as energy okay let's let's say we want to look at potential energy okay we know that potential energy mathematically is given as mass translation due to gravity times h and if that is the case we want to break this down we can say this is inherently mass we can't break down to any other quantity again as you due to gravity is velocity over time velocity itself is maybe you can say displacement over time then multiplied by one over t so it's velocity over time that is association due to gravity then height that is just distance so i can call that d so what we have here is we have m a single m d we have in two places then t as the denominator that is t is to power minus two and we want to put it as um the base fundamental unit we can say this is nothing but for the mass we have m for distance that is l raised to power 2 and then for time that is capital t raised to power minus 2 so what we are looking for inherently are two other quantities whose dimensions is going to be ml square t minus 2 okay so if you want to look at that i know that work and moment are going to give us that exact dimensions and what is work work is actually force times distance okay force itself is mass times acceleration okay then we we'll still have distance there so if you want to look at um, the breakdown of this you can say mass this is just m okay acceleration acceleration is velocity over time that distance over time which is velocity then over time one over t then multiply by distance i have that as d and you can see that's corresponding to what we have here exactly that we have it as m d square and t minus 2 which inherently will still land out as m l square t raised to power minus 2 so that is quite on track work is having the same unit as energy we did this breakdown of the dimension for us to get that in the same way we can look at moment moment is actually a turning force so it is force on try by distance moving the perpendicular direction like for example you have um, we have a range if you have a range that you're actually using and then you are turning it if you apply a force like this and this is the perpendicular distance and this is f moment is the product of that force multiplied by the particular distance so eventually it will just give us something like this again that we are having force and distance which is mad and eventually mat and then that will also give us md square t raised to the power minus 2 whose dimension will also be ml square t raised to the power minus 2 so we can see that um, energy in this case we even use potential energy as a case study you can use kinetic energy students you can just try your hand on that use um, kinetic energy okay half mv square and then you can see that you also arrive at the same thing here and we have found that work is also having the same moment is also having the same so work and moment they have the same unit as energy all right yeah, in this question i've been told to sketch a velocity time graph of the motion of a pendulum bob which is swinging from one end to another one end to another okay so if you want to look at that this is what the movement of that pendulum bob is going to be like so if you can see here it's just fixed okay and then the bob is swinging from left to right left to right left to right now this is what we notice if you actually take this particular let's say this is point a this is point b and this point c what you notice is that at every point in time the pendulum bob is tending to return to point b okay so even if you are starting from b and you are going to c 
you discover that it will get to a point, it will revert back to B. Then it will go to A. At once it gets to A, it will also what? Revert back to B. So generally, since the acceleration is directed to the center to B, then that means that your velocity time graph will take a shape and look like this from here, which you can say is A, it will come here, it will peak at B, and then it will go back to C. And then it will just repeat that circle again and again. So I can call this point A just as a reason of explaining what I have over there. I can call this point B and I call it point C. So this is going to be the velocity time graph. The velocity will increase anytime it's pointed towards the center, towards B. Okay. And once it's going away from B, the velocity will decrease. So this is actually how the velocity time graph will look like. And once we'll be able to sketch this. I go with the question. So here we are told that a meter rule of mass 15 grams pivoted at the 30 centimeter mark balanced horizontally when a load of 25 grams was hung at the 18 centimeter mark. First, we have to sketch the setup and then if the position is moved to the 33 centimeter mark, by how much we need to be careful there? By how much must the load be reduced to maintain the horizontal balance? Of rule. Let's first take this this first scenario, okay? Because if we are moving it, that means we need to draw another diagram. So let's just first and foremost try and sketch the setup. So we are told that the meter rule is having mass 15 grams. Then we will take the assumption that it is a uniform meter rule, okay? So it being uniform means that the weight we act in the middle, okay? So this will be the weight of it, and that is 15 grams. Okay, then it's pivoted at the 30 centimeter mark. So 30 centimeter, maybe something here. It's pivoted there. It balanced horizontal when a load of 25 grams was hung at the 18 centimeter mark. So 18 centimeter, if this is 30, maybe middle will be here. So 18, middle here, 18 will be somewhere here. So this is a load of 25 grams. Okay. So for that set of me, I would just like to just depict my distances to say, yeah, this is 18 centimeters. So I will have 18 centimeters. Okay. And then, yeah, we are told that the pivot is at 30 centimeters. If we've taken 18 out, that means this will be 12 centimeters. Okay. And then that is an addition of 30. This will now be 20 centimeters. So that the 3 addition will be 50, and then again, I will have the other 50 centimeters at the other hand of the So, what we are asked to draw is just as shown here. In the first case, this is the solution that they are expecting us to do. Now, for the second question, that they are told that um, we are being told that the position is moved. Then we also need to move the position. Okay. So, you add this diagram first. Okay. And then you draw a in short, Let me just draw again. So that we would not just be confused, we we'll just know that yes, this is the way to go about it. So still the weight we have at the middle. So this is 15 grams. But now the pivot is moved to 33 centimeters. Let me say this is my 33 centimeters. So this is 33 centimeters. Then the load was initially at 18 centimeters. So we still have this load here at 18. So this is, we don't know it now. We don't know the new weight because they say that by how much must the load be reduced? Or we just know that from here to here, this is 18 centimeters. Okay. So now this is 18 centimeters. Okay. And then since from the edge of the root meter rule to the center is 50. 33 being out means that this remaining one will be 50 minus 33. And that will be 17 centimeters. Okay. For the body to be in equilibrium, we know that the sum of the clockwise moments and the sum of the counterclockwise moment must be equal. And here we only have one one. So here, if you are taking moment about this fulcrum here, then we can see that this edge jump will be a counterclockwise moment. And this 15 gram, the weight of the meter rule itself will be a clockwise moment. And since we are saying that the sum of the clockwise moment 
must be equal to the sum of the counterclockwise moment and that moment is four times perpendicular distance so here 33 is from the edge of the winter root to the four chrome 18 is out of it already so this will be 33 minus 18 so this is 15 centimeters okay let me just clarify that so that there will be no confusion there. Okay. So, taking a moment about the fulcrum, we can say this particular force, x multiplied by 15, we can say that 15x is equal to this particular 15 multiplied by its own distance 2. And that is 15 multiplied by 17. Okay. So, we are losing the product of the mass, the weight, times the perpendicular distance at right angle to it. So that's why we are getting this, that the sum of moments counterclockwise is equal to the sum of the moments in the clockwise direction. So this is what is giving, warranting us to get this. And of course, we can see that this 15 can cancel this 15, so that S itself is actually 17 grams. But nobody asked us to find this. They said, by how much must the load be reduced? So since initial load, initial load was given as 25 grams. Now the new load, new load, we just got to be 17 grams. Then the reduction, this is where it gets interesting. And this is where you need to actually read your question one. It will be 25 minus 17. And that would be 25 minus 17 is 8 grams. So 8 grams must be reduced from the initial load for us to have this particular metal rod still in equilibrium for it to be balanced. All right. Then this question we are asked to distinguish between elastic and inelastic collisions. And for us to just take it on a light note, this is a pictorial view and a table list of what we are being asked. In the first case, for the elastic collision, kinetic energy is not conserved. And then the final velocity after collision is not the same. So this is um, U1, this is U2. If they collide, you can see that V1 and V2, they are not the same. They are still moving in some different direction as typified in this diagram, okay? So the bodies also do not stick together after collision. You can see they are going their different ways. But in inelastic collision, kinetic energy is not conserved at all in this case. And then, if they are initially moving with initial velocity u1 and u2, after the collision, the final velocity after the collision is the same. They have a common v, okay? And then the bodies, they stick together after the collision. So, um, the prospect is that, just as noted by a cartoon guide to physics here, so if it is in elastic collision, then they're supposed to stick together, move on, and in that case, kinetic energy is not conserved. But if it's elastic, the major issue is that kinetic energy is conserved and then their final velocity is not the same. So here yeah, in this question on heat, we are told that a calorimeter containing 65 grams of ice at minus 10 degrees Celsius is heated uniformly until it boils after 180 seconds. Our mandate is to sketch a labeled graph to illustrate the variation of temperature of the ice with respect to time. So we have our graph here. And what inherently we are being asked is that what is going to be the stages that the ice at minus 10 degrees Celsius is going to pass through from the state in which it is highest to the state in which it boils and vaporizes at 180 seconds. So if we are to look at that, this is just um, a very good the notion of what we can get. And I've just noted a number of points here. Now, from minus 10 to 0, taking its temperature from minus 10 degrees Celsius to 0 degrees Celsius, initially it was ice, but now it's being converted, it's, it's melting, okay? And now when it gets to 0 degrees Celsius, what is going to happen is that at that constant temperature, some time is going to elapse in which that particular ice is going to be liquefied. And then, once it has turned completely to water, it will increase in temperature until it gets to the boiling point of water, which is 100 degrees Celsius. Then after then, it's just going to be maintaining that 100 degrees Celsius, but vaporization is going to be occurring. So 
This is actually the graph that we are asked to construct. In this question, we are told that a 40 Celsius thermometer reads 5 degrees Celsius at the melting point of pure ice and 95 degrees Celsius at the boiling point of water at normal pressure. So that's quite interesting. Both the upper and lower regions are quite wrong. I managed to calculate the correct temperature reading when it reads 40 degrees Celsius. And then we're also to check the temperature at which is reading will be exactly the same as the correct temperature reading okay no problem so if you have to look at um something like our thermometer here and with information that we are giving that is reading five degrees celsius at melting point we know that melting point originally is zero degrees celsius so we can denote it that yes when it's reading five degrees celsius it's actually supposed to read zero degrees celsius quite good to note that and then and it's also reading 95 degrees Celsius at the boiling point of water. So we know that the boiling point of water is supposed to be 100 degrees Celsius. So this is the reading of the 40 thermometer. And this is the original reading that is supposed to be reading. But we're also noting first and foremost, they say that the, we have to get the correct temperature when it reads 40 degrees Celsius. So that's why we are calling that X. And what we just need to do in this particular case is just to look at a graded difference and try and cross multiply like here this scale here will just relate it to the scale on the right hand side so i want to take for me i love taking the difference okay from the unknown to the base and then from the maximum to the lowest so i can say x minus zero over 100 minus zero so i'm taking this minus zero first then i'm saying 100 also minus zero so the same thing i also do to the reading of the thermometer that this is equal to the corresponding value for x will be 40 minus the lower limit now is 5 over 95 which is the upper limit minus still that same lower limit 5 so i can say from here i just have x over 100 is equal to 40 minus 5 is 35 95 minus 5 that is 90 so i can cross multiply in this particular case to say x is going to be 35 times 100 divided by 90 okay so if i bring in my calculator for that 35 times 100 divided by 90 so this is 38.8 the bar means that is a repeated value so so i can just say we have 38.89 degrees celsius as the value of x which is the reading when the thermometer is reading 40 degrees celsius so that is um the very first thing we are asked to find in the second case, we are asked to look at the temperature at which the reading will be exactly the same as the correct temperature reading. So, let me just say, I'm assuming that in that case, what I'm going to have is something like um, a value, this is y, and here the value is also y, okay? So, just like I did there, I can say this particular reading minus the lower limit over 100 minus the lower limit, in this case, the same y minus the lower limit over 95 minus the lower limit so that's what i would just like to do now to say here i'm looking at y minus zero over 100 minus zero is equal to y minus five over 95 minus five okay so i can see what that means is we have y over 100 is equal to y minus five over 95 minus five is 90 so easily i can say i want to cross multiply this that 90y is equal to 100 100 times y is 100y 100 times minus 5 is minus 500 so that if i rearrange i'm going to have um 100y minus 90y is equal to 500 and that means that 100 minus 90 is 10y is equal to 500 then dividing both sides by 10 that means that inherently this 10 will cut this 10 and then y that i'm looking for will be 500 over 10 which is 50 degrees celsius okay okay so the midpoint is still the same and then the temperature which the thermometer will be reading and then which is also the correct temperature for this particular case is 50 degrees celsius all right In this question, we are being asked to state Snell's law of refraction. We are also being asked that why does a musical note 
of the same amplitude and frequency being played on a flute, guitar, and trumpet sounds different. So, for the solution to this, we we'll look at to say that Stent's law states that the ratio of the sine of the angle of incidence to the sine of the angle of refraction is constant for a given pair of media, and that ratio is what we actually call the refractive index. Okay. On the other hand, musical notes is of different sound in different musical instruments due to the presence of notes that are furious frequencies that are produced along with the fundamental frequency. Or we can say that it's because of the overtones or harmonics of different or maybe we can say higher frequencies or pitch of the higher frequencies that are being produced. Okay, So the fundamental frequencies are there, but then the overtones, the subsequent ones that will be building on it, they are actually going to be overtones and then they will have different pitches. That's why sound will sound different in a fluid scooter and trumpet as compared to one another. Yeah, in this question, we are being mandated to look at similarity and differences between a camera and the human eye. So, if you want to look at it, for the similarities, both of them use converging lens and both of them are sensitive to light. And then for the formation of the image on both the eye and the camera, the formation of the images are normally inverted. Okay. And now for the differences, the camera has a fixed focal length, but the woman eye can actually have varied focal length. You can actually tend to tint your eye or maybe focus more. So that will just a little bit affect the focal length that you are going to actually form eventually. Now, distance between the film and lens can be varied, but the distance between the lens and the retina is fixed. There's no way you can change it. It's there and it is as good as it comes. Then, of course, the camera is. A mechanical device while the human eye is actually a natural organ all right so here yeah, in this question we have been told that a light ray traveled from water into the air at an angle of incidence of 30 degrees and we have to calculate the speed of that light ray in water and the angle of refraction in the air okay very good but we need to note some peculiarities to this question we are told that the light ray is traveling from water so this is water Okay, and then it's traveling to the air. So that is what we are giving. And then we have to find the speed in water. So speed in water, we are looking for. We have to find the angle of refraction in the air, R in the air. That's also another thing that we are looking for. As a rule of thumb, we should know that the refractive index is actually given as the speed in air as a ratio of the speed in the medium we are considering here yeah, the medium is water so the refractive index of water is actually the speed of the light ray in here over the speed of the light ray in water so since we have been giving that n to be 1.33 and then we have the speed of that light ray in here to be 3 exponent 8 meter per second we can find the speed in water to be the speed in here over that refractive index so that will be 3 times 10 raised to the power 8 meters per second divided by 1.33. So, you to say I have 3 exponent 8 divided by 1.33. So this is, let me put this in standard form. Okay, so it's exponent 6. If I want to move this point in two places, I can say 1, 2. So this will be exponent 8. So it will be 2.25. But I have this 5, so it have to be rounded up to one and added to the initial five so that's 2.26 exponent 8 so this is 2.26 exponent 8 meters per second as the speed of the light ray in water so that is the first solution that we need to get in the second case we are going to have to look for the angle of refraction in the air so we can make use of sine i over sine r but now sine i over sine r will have to be the refractive index in the air, which is generally unitary, okay, over the refractive index in water. So now, we are doing like this because we are moving from water to air. That's why we need to reverse this particular refractive index. Initially, that is originally that the refractive index of air was the refractive index of water. But since the refractive index of air is just one, we are good and fine like this, such that if we cross multiply, if we have to cross multiply here, we are looking for um, sine r. We already have sine i. We can say sine r is equal to n sine 
i. So that sign r r mean the angle of refraction in the air that we are looking for is equal to n, which is 1.33 multiplied by sine i. Sine i is sine 30. Sine 30 is actually 0 0.5. So this is 0 0.6. 0.665 okay so r will be the arc sine of 0 0.665 okay so you can use our calculator arc sine 0 0.665 what's that going to give us 41.682 you can just say 41.68 this is 41.68 degrees so our understanding of the fact that this particularity of light is moving from water to air had helped us to holistically solve this question to find the speed in water and then the angle of refraction in the air. Here in this question, we have to state the mathematical representation of the Newton's law of gravitation. So, notice what we are being asked. They are saying what they are interested in, nothing but the mathematical representation. So, you just need to write out the formula for that Newton's law of gravitation that the force of attraction between two bodies is proportional to the product of their masses and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them now the r is the distance between those two bodies the masses are m1 and m2 and g is the gravitational constant so once you just write out this that is as good as it gets your full mark is assured i'm just including this as a peculiar view for you to understand what we are talking about in this case here yeah, in this question we are being asked that how is the compass need to use to draw Magnetic lines of force around a bar magnet. Now, um, student, you just need to be able to capture this effectively. In the first place, you need to place the magnet and compass on a plane sheet. So here, yeah, we have the magnet, we have the plane sheet, they are placed together, okay? And then, you have to adjust the position of the compass until the needle is pointing away from the magnet and you mark the position of the head and tail of the needle. So this is what we are talking about here. So if you put the compass here initially, you can see that the pointer is pointing towards the magnet so we don't want to start from there we want to start in a position in which that needle will be pointing away from the magnet and so this here is that particular position okay and once you get that you are going to move the compass to another further point from the magnet then you also mark the needle position in that location so that's why we're having something like this here again okay and then just repeat the procedure here you repeat the procedure here you repeat the procedure here until we are seeing the pointer also touching the magnet in this particular last case. So, after doing all of those, what is left is for you to join all those marks, all those arrows that we have actually drawn, the one shown in blue here, okay? You just join them with a line. So, this is like that line we are talking about. And then we would have drawn one magnetic line of force. Then you just repeat the process, do another one, do another one, and that is how it's just being done. Now, um, this is how it's being postulated that whenever you see a magnet and you are seeing lines of forces drawn from the north to the south pole, is is an assumption that yes, we've done this and we have gotten those magnetic lines as acting in that direction. So experimentally, you can also do that, and this is what you are going to get in that case. All right. A good question for us to consider here is that we should distinguish between series and parallel combinations of resistors. So um, this is just a table highlighting those differences and this is a diagram that is also depicting here yeah, in the first case the resistances in series and here yeah, the resistances in parallel for the resistors in series the voltage across each resistor is different because it is current that is the same in a series circuit okay but voltage across each resistive load is going to be different so we have v1 for r1 and v2 for r2 however in a parallel setup is the same voltage that is flowing across loads in parallel resistors in parallel will carry the same voltage so v across r2 is also equal to v across r1 okay so for the current that is flowing same current is going to flow across each resistor in a series circuit however when you are looking at the parallel circuit the current will be different so that's why we have i1 and i2 okay now in a series circuit the effective resistance is the sum of the individual resistances so in this case r total is going to be R1 plus R2 for the series setup. But in this particular case, it is the inverse. The effective resistance we are going to have here, 1 over R total is equal to 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2. So if you want to find the LCM, 
you can say what you are going to be having is something like 1 over r total is equal to lcm will be r1 r2 then if you just factor this will be r2 plus r1 so that your r total will be the inverse of that that it is r1 r2 divided by r1 plus r2 okay and then finally um, the effective resistance in a series circuit is going to be greater than the parallel arrangement of resistors so r total here is actually greater than this r total okay so these are just the differences between series and parallel combinations of resistors and if you are able to think three points if you are able to raise them effectively that should be good and fine to earn you your full marks as requested in this question Yeah, we have been told that the current of 3 amperes passes through a heating coil of length 65.2 centimeters, which has a cross sectional area of 3.2 millimeters square. So, students, first and foremost, I want you to just note insight into what you are being given. Here, yeah, the length is given in centimeters, the cross sectional area is given in millimeters square. So, those are not the same, but we need to be consistent with our unit, okay? And then, this particular heating coil have a resistance of 3.5 ohms. If the current passes through the coil for 5 minutes, again, that is a minute, we need to convert to seconds if you are going to be using that. We have to calculate the resistivity of the coil and the energy that is dissipated by the coil. So, this is a pictorial view of what we are having. And then, um, for me, I would just like to, first and foremost, convert all the units. Here, we have 65.2 centimeters, and that will be 65.2 times 10 raised to power minus 2 meters. So, that's going to give me... 0.652 meters okay so this is the length of the heating coil the cross-sectional area we are given as 3.2 millimeter square now you need to be careful we are talking about millimeter but not just millimeter we are talking about area so it's the square of the millimeter so for us to convert we need to say this is nothing but 3.2 okay if it is just a singular millimeter we would have said times 10 is power minus 3 but because we are squaring it so we also need to square this so this is nothing but 3.2 times 10 raised to power minus 6 meter square so that is what we need to note so that we don't make mistake in this particular case so we are giving the resistance to be 3.5 ohms that's good and then we are giving the time in which the current is passing through it to be 5 minutes that will be 5 times 60 seconds which is 300 seconds so so we can now go ahead to try and find the resistivity of a coil. Generally, resistance of a conductor is given as resistivity multiplied by length over the cross-sectional area, such that from here we can find our resistivity to be the resistance multiplied by the area divided by the length of that particular conductor. So if you want to put in all the parameters, we have resistance, we have the area, we have the length, we can say our resistivity in this case is going to be, the resistance is 3.5 ohms, multiplied by the area that's 3.2 times 10 raised to the power minus 6 meters square over the length the length is 0.652 meters so we can just get this we can use our calculator to evaluate this that we have um, 3.5 times 3.2 exponent minus 6 divided by 0.652 so what's that going to give us mm, so this is um zero point okay let me just put that in 17.18 or if i just move this again 1.72 exponent minus 5 okay so this is this is 1.72 exponent minus 5 and what's going to be the unit it will be ohm now this meter would have cut this meter to remain only one mea so it is ohm meter right so that is the resistivity of this particular heating coil okay so in the second case we have to find the energy dissipated by the coil energy for this particular case we can find by saying it is the product of the current multiplied by the voltage multiplied by time and if you look at all of those okay we don't we don't have the voltage but we know that voltage is i r so here it will just be i square r multiplied by t so our i it is 3 we have 3 square our r is 3.5 okay our t is 300 seconds so we just need to find this on the calculator to say we are having 9 multiplied by 3 
0.5 multiplied by 300 okay so this is 9450 so this is going to be 9450 dose as the energy dissipated and we have gotten the resistivity of the coil initially in this question we are asked to define viscosity and we are also asked to state two fundamental assumptions of the molecular theory of matter here is the solution to this question that viscosity is the internal friction that exists between the layers of molecules of fluids whether it be liquid or gas so that is what we actually allow sometimes maybe a pond skater to actually be on the surface of the water because there is some level of viscosity on the water surface okay so that is that about that now for the assumptions of the molecular theory of matter number one we can say that matter is made up of molecules and those molecules are in constant rapid motion and they also experience force of attraction and then of course matters can exist in solid liquid and gaseous state so this holistically will help us to answer this question and that will be done with that here we are being told that the kinetic energy of electrons that is emitted from a metal surface when light or frequency f falls on it is 4 exponents minus 19 joules now if h is the Planck's constant we are to express the threshold frequency of the metal in terms of the given parameters here in the equation so this is quite interesting you can notice that we are not giving any value of the constant like we are not giving h to be a particular value and we are not giving c to be any particular value that's why they are saying that we should express the threshold okay threshold frequency in terms of the given parameter so that's what we will try to do in this particular case but this pictorial view is helping us to explain it that okay there is this light of frequency f and of course the amount of that energy that's coming from the light is hf okay when it is incidence on this matter there is a kinetic energy with which electron will be emitted and of course the metal itself has inherently a work function and what we normally work with is that the energy hf is actually equal to the work function plus the kinetic energy in this particular case all right so if that is what we have hf is the photon energy f is what we are giving as just ordinary f we are not giving its value but we are giving that the kinetic energy that is emitted is 4 exponent minus 19 joules so in this particular question we can say hf which you still have is the work function now the work function itself is a product of the Planck's constant and the threshold frequency f naught so we have it that this is h f naught plus since we are giving the kinetic energy we don't need to write k already we just need to write it is 4 exponent minus 19 joules so since we are asked to express the threshold frequency in terms of the terms then we should make f naught the subject of the formula in this particular case so so here if we are to rearrange we can say h f naught it's going to be when this four moves to the other side we have hf minus 4 exponent minus 19 and then f naught itself is going to be hf minus 4 exponent minus 19 divided by the plus constant h okay and if we want to break it into its constituent terms we can say is that f naught equals to hf over h is actually f then minus and um, we we'll still have 4 exponent minus 19 divided by h i just broke this into its two times hf over h then four times exponent minus 19 over h and this is what we are going to have and the unit is going to be at so this is the expression for the threshold frequency of this meta in terms of the given parameters for this particular question here in this question we are told that light of frequency 6.62 exponent 14 hertz is incident on the metal surface with work function 2.08 exponent minus 19 joules our mandate is to calculate the wavelength of the light and the energy of the light so here yeah, in this question we are giving the plant's constant h and we are giving the speed of light and a typical example of what this scenario is looking like is this we have some photon of light that is of some particular energy incident on this matter we are looking for the wavelength and we are looking for that energy but we are giving f so we are giving the frequency that it is 6.62 exponent 14 hertz okay and then we're also giving the speed of light to be 3 exponent 8 meters per second. Generally, we know that um, the velocity of light is given as frequency multiplied by lambda. That velocity here is C. So let me just put that. That's what we're actually having 
inherently is c now this is c is equal to frequency multiplied by lambda so the wavelength lambda will be the speed of light over the frequency and since we have the speed of light and frequency we can say lambda in this case is going to be 3 times 10 raised to the power 8 over the frequency 6.62 exponent 14 so we can bring in our calculator to say 3 exponent 8 divided by 6.62 exponent 14 so this is going to give us 453 exponent minus 9 but if i move it two places back if i move the decimal point two places back that would be 4.53 exponent minus 7 so this is that's expressive enough 4.53 exponent minus 7 and what's going to be the unit for the wavelength it is meters okay so that is as good as it gets so this is question number one in question number two we are asked to find the energy of the light and already we have defined that that energy is actually the Planck's constant multiplied by the frequency do we have the frequency yes do we have the Planck's constant yes we are given so that energy is going to be nothing but the Planck's constant h 6.6 exponent minus 34 and the frequency 6.62 exponent 14 at okay so again our calculator will be of f to us here we have 6.6 exponent minus 34 multiplied by 6.62 exponent 14 so please just ensure that there's no mistake you can check and check again that you put the values correctly and you can solve for that that's 4.3692 exponent minus 19 or I can say um 4.37 so this is 4.37 exponent minus 19 and what's going to be our unit for energy that is joules so this is just how we go about solving this question and will be good and fine here in this question we are asked to list four components of a slide projector and this is a pictorial view of the slide projector which is an optomechanical device you just put in your picture slides into like this lot and then the mechanism with which is going to work and project those images that you have inserted onto a projecting screen so some of the components include the projection lens okay the slide carrier that you are going to insert your slide in a condenser the light source that will be beamed on those particular images a concave mirror through which the light rays will pass and then we also need a projector screen and so if you are able to just list like um four of these then you'll be good and you'll be fine and the question would have been answered and dusted here's a question asking us how electricity is being generated from a dam okay so let me just let me just use a picture to explain this normally um as simple as it gets just for you to answer the question you can say that the dam water will pass or fall through a narrow opening of the dam and it will rotate the turbine the turbine in turn will rotate the dynamo which generates electricity if you are able to state that that is good but for me i used to say this a picture is worth a thousand watt so here this is the reservoir okay let me use ink red ink so this is the reservoir okay and this is the dam the water has been stopped initially so if you want to actually start generating electricity the water inlet we ask to pass through this pen stock and then that water as it is flowing it will be turning this particular turbine and the turbine itself will just rotate the dynamo that will go ahead to generate electricity which can now be passed through the transformer and then connected to the transmission lines and distributed to wherever it is that it is to be distributed to so this is just as good as it gets if you are able to just state these two statements you will be good and fine and end your full marks here in this question we have to contrast a wet leclanche cell and the lead acid accumulator so here is the tabulated differences if you want to compare maybe any two or three will be sufficient in a wet leclanche cell you will notice that it is just a primary cell whereas the accumulator cell is a secondary cell the positive terminal of the Lacrange cell is carbon rod, but the positive terminal for the accumulator cell is lead peroxide. Okay. The negative terminal of the, of the Lacrange cell is zinc rod, but the negative terminal of the accumulator cell is lead. Now the Lacrange cell cannot be recharged, whereas the accumulator cell can be recharged and reused. And for the Lacrange cell, the current only lasts for a short time, but for the accumulator cell, since it is a secondary cell, the current will last for a long time and then even the durability definitely will last far more longer so you can find that 
has been used in your motor vehicle because it is being recharged and the current can last for a long time. And here we have been told that a load of 200 kg is raised through a height of 6 meters in 4 seconds. We are to calculate the time rate of energy that is used in horsepower. Okay? So if you want to have a pictorial view of what we are talking about, it's just something like this here, in which we have that load, 200 kg as a mass. So here, this is the mass. Okay? Then 6 meters, this is the height. And then the time that was taken is actually 4 seconds. We are to calculate the time rate of energy that is used in horsepower. We are giving g to be 10 meter per second square and one horsepower to be 746 watts. So, what is the formula for the time rate of energy? Look at what they are saying. They say the time rate of energy. That means we are actually talking about power. Okay? It's power, it's not energy. So, you can see that for this particular case, the power is going to be mgh over t. That's just energy over time. And since it is an object being raised through some height, so this will be good and fine. So if you want to put in those parameters, that power will be the mass, which is 200 kilograms, multiplied by the acceleration due to gravity, 10, multiplied by the height, which is 6 meters, divided by the time, that is 4 seconds. So you can say 4 year 1, 4 in 20, that is 50. So we have 500 times 6, 500 times 6, that is 3000 watts, okay? But now, look at what we are giving. We are being asked to find it in horsepower. We are given that one horsepower is equal to 746 watts. But now, we have this 3000 watts. But we are looking for the equivalent amount of horsepower. We can call that X. And with X, if you cross multiply here, we will see that X will be 3000 divided by 746. So we can use our calculator to evaluate that. that we have... 3000 divided by 746. So, what's this? This is 4.02. So, this is nothing but 4.02 horsepower as the time rate of energy of this particular system. Alright. And so, with that, we have come to the end of this video, and it has been a very wonderful journey in which we took our time to look at. All of the 17 questions Neko is really trying. 17 questions for the exam. Well, of course, it's you need to pick some questions. It's not that you answer all, you answer some, and they specify in the exam. And then I believe that um, with this, you have been able to get some better insight into these questions. You'll be able to answer them correctly if you are facing them in your exam. And all of these are done in a bit to prepare you for excellence. So if you just want some more videos, you can check our playlist. We have quite a whole lot of resources in physics, in mathematics, and even in chemistry that can help you to build excellence in your academics. And we want to trust that God willing, that will come to pass and you'll be the best that God has created you to be. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel, it's Delta Academy, and until next time, God bless you.